So, a bit of something different compared to normal. A PD customer's car rather than all these new common rails we seem to be tuning at the minute. We've done absolutely tons of these. This is probably, other than Jerome's drag car and when we were running PD engines, this is probably the most powerful one that we've done. It's definitely the most powerful daily one anyway. It's, um, it's had a ton of money spent on it. I think he's gone for the rat look and achieved it, maybe unintentionally. I don't know, the car's definitely not a, a looker from the outside. It's, um, it's rough and ready, but to get to this level everywhere with the brakes, suspension, bushes, anti-roll bars, all, it's obviously got loads of stuff done to it, you'll see. You're talking 20 grams worth of stuff at least. It's just, everything adds up. The guys who owns its original plan were just to turn it up a little bit and obviously as the bug bites, he was getting a lot of stuff done in the country where he's from. Some of the work weren't quite up to scratch, causing him a few problems. So we ended up getting it over here. We got it to, I think it was 400 horsepower with the nitrous, 320s we are, something like that. He had it for a while, happy with it. Um, I think some of the parts that he got on there that weren't, some of it weren't ours, some of it was. He wanted, uh, one of his friends wanted to buy him, I think, and he just said, well, I might as well put all your stuff on and I want you to build an engine for me and do some extra stuff, so. And it's, because it's been here so long, Every week he adds different parts onto it, so it's never quite finished. And I think now we're the closest we've been to having it finished. So it's probably a good time to start doing it. Hopefully it doesn't rain before we get a chance to go out in it again, because that seems to happen every time we plan on doing something to do with this car. But we'll, uh, we'll have a little look round it. fairly busy under the bonnet. One of the reasons it's not as neat and tidy as we'd hope is the electric water pump which is hidden down here at an angle, hiding out at way. It's starting to rain now as I've said, hopefully it weren't going to rain. The electric water pump on a build like this, once you start going past a 2260, maybe even a 25 and not wanting the peak power, once you want the peak power out of everything, you're going to need an electric water pump in our opinion. We've had too many problems on anything other than the drag stuff. The drag stuff seems fine on a normal water pump, but the track stuff and fast daily, we are a big open front with radiators hanging out, and bonnets lifted up at back and trying to get as much cooling through as possible. You need the water pump because they just get too hot. You crack the block, you walk the head, People blame it on it doing too much power, and it's not. It's just you can't keep things cool. Obviously, there's no point having the best water pump in the world, and then you're putting 50-50 glycol coolant, or antifreeze, it's not coolant. Um, no point putting that in there, because you just not... Cool, glycol coolant's just not got the specific heat capacity of water. It's like, I'm sure it's something stupid, like 50% less effective than water. It's plain water, but the problem you've got if you put plain water in, you've got the corrosion issues, especially if you've got dissimilar metals with aluminium and uh, cast iron. So that's why you'll see cars will, like Dean's Border, which is a pretty similar spec to this, um, not as crazy yet. It never makes as much power either. Um, when he drained his one, he, we, we did all the work years ago, and the coolant was just like sludge. And it lasted, I think the engine lasted about 70 foul like that, draining it every now and again and just putting new coolant in. It just always kept coming back until he changed every radiator and put a new block in. You can't run, the rust and the sludge from running straight water, it's the best for cooling, but it corrodes everything. And obviously then that starts blocking your radiators up. 
start overeating. That's what Dean started doing. Started causing some problems. And obviously in winter, you're going to have problems with turning your ice and cracking your block and your radiators and stuff anyway. So the compromise we make on our track stuff, because we don't use a lot of it in sub-zero temperatures, we use a product called No Erosion. And then we use just plain water. Ideally, use reverse osmosis water, which is what your window cleaners use to clean your window. So that's pretty pure water, not distilled. Distilled's got absolutely nothing in it. And then the problem you've got with distilled water is that pulls all the minerals and all the uh, aluminium and uh, iron oxides from the, the block and the head, pulls them into the water and makes it even worse. So you use reverse osmosis water, that's just not gonna, none of the nasty stuff in. Um, which rainwater is as near to reverse osmosis water as you can get. So if you've got rainwater collection, filter that, put that in, that's good stuff. And the no erosion, that stops the corrosion. That's the coolant we run as a summer coolant. So if you live in a country that never gets anywhere near freezing, that's what you want to run. We found that drops coolant temps by something crazy like 10 degrees. It's ridiculous how much better running just plain water compared to even a weak mix of glycol. If you're running 50-50 like some of the really cold countries have to run, when you're talking 30 degrees in summer, your coolant temps just go through the roof. And no matter what water pump you've got on, it's not going to work. So, we've obviously been running that in our track stuff, but then we get into the point where some of our daily cars, like, and the stuff that we're running in the winter, like the Citigo and the A5, they're needing something a little bit better. So no matter what radiator and water pumps we're going to put on them, we're still going to have cooling problems. So we've got this stuff. This is Hypercool, which is it's like a, a wetting agent, as they call it. It removes the surface tension of the water and stuff like that. So you get better cooling from the water. It's got the corrosion inhibitors that the no erosion's got, because it's made by the same company. But it's also good to be mixed with... Um, the glycol uh, antifreezers. So, for our daily stuff and uh, stuff that we use in winter, we're going to be putting a weak mixture of glycol to start. When as it gets colder, we'll just top, we'll just top the uh, the antifreeze up. But that means then we can run them all year round. We should get the the sort of results that we got from the the no erosion and plain water even with a bit of glycol in there. For like the Arosa, we're going to run this stuff and no antifreeze, and we should get a little bit better again. We'll try and do some accurate testing, but it can't be any worse than what we've got already. And it's not expensive, and one of those uh, pint uh, bottles, they'll do 20 litres of coolant, so it's enough to do usually two fills on most cars. So for what it is, it's worth doing. And we sort of... We're always sceptical at the claims that these sort of companies make, but the guys from No Erosion said what they'd do, and it worked absolutely fine for us, so we're definitely going to use that. So that's the water pump, the coolant. We've got one riding line thermostats, because you can't leave the thermostat in the block, which is normally here, because your water pump's pushing against it, whereas your normal water pump's pulling. So we put riding line thermostat here. The back of the, the thermostat's got a little tapping on there, that's so we've got circulation still in the hot circuit of the engine before the thermostat opens because if you if you don't have that on there you'll have the water pump pushing in and it can't get out at all and then you're going to have to wait for the convection of the engine to get to here which would take a lot longer we want that thermostat to open as quickly and efficiently as possible obviously you don't want the coolant to be cold so if we took the thermostat out completely, you'd struggle to get it past 40 degrees, even 50 degrees. Even on the pulse mode on these, you can tweak the pulse mode to get it to behave a bit better, but it's still difficult to get them up to temp. So even like on our track car, we put a thermostat in there just because we had a piston crack one time because we were struggling on a cold, it was no, Castle Coombe, I think it was, it was fairly cold in the morning. We couldn't get it to tick over past 50 degrees. So just as we need to go, track's open, let's have it cracked a piston and we put that down to it being 50 degrees then straight up to 90 50 90 50 90 it's not going to help obviously your piston's going to be a lot hotter than uh, than your coolant so we put it down to that since then we've run a, run a thermostat and have no no similar issues we've got the man 
catch tank on there, which these are the big industrial things, probably a little bit over spec for something like this, but when you're running an engine like this, you need to be able to catch all the blow by gases. We put the clear pipe on there so you can see there's not much coming in, there's no air, oil coming into there at least anyway. So much to talk about on this car, it's uh, knowing where to start, knowing where to end. The fuel filter that you can see here, this is a two micron filter that we've got. The standard are probably like 12 or something like that, so they're letting a lot of crap through that wouldn't normally let through. This T piece is just going to the gauge because we'll we'll probably have to cut through a pitch because I don't think we'll be able to see it from here. But we've done a completely different setup on this for the fuel inside. We've not got the return going anywhere near the filter, so the fuel's not getting any hotter than it needs to get. The return just literally comes from the engine straight to the cooler underneath, straight back to the tank. But we've put a, a fast fuel pump on there, which is a 120 gallon per hour, only a low pressure because the PDs only need 10 or 12 psi optimal. This is doing a little bit more at idle and a little bit less than that at full load, but we never get into vacuum because the problem with this at full load, full chat, it will vacuum it up at about three and a half grand, which didn't seem to affect power too much. But at some point, you're going to empty the bowl in the inside the tank and uh, then you're going to run out of fuel. So We've put the better fuel pump on there. I'll see if we can get in and uh, look at what we've done in the sender. If not, we'll cut to another picture of that. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the fuel delivery side. 160% injectors. One and a half ported heads. This is the golf ball dimpled ported head. It's got oversized pistons. This is on a two litre, I believe. Um, I'd have to triple check that now. Second guessing myself, but two litre, which in my opinion you don't need to go for the two litre, but if you've damaged a block or you want to you want to unshroud the valves a little more and get that a little bit more, two litre's not a not a bad idea, but for a drag application, especially if you're pushing things to the absolute death, more material between the bars is, is more important than having a, a bigger bar in my opinion. So we've got H beam rods, lightened and balanced crank, balanced to the flywheel. Not too important an engine that's only revving to 5600, but it never hurts to be too balanced. The pistons we balance them weigh in 0 0.2, 0 0.02 grams. The rods are balanced to the same end to end. Cranks balanced, flywheel. Um, ARP hardware, wherever we can put it. We've got um, our inlet manifold, custom tip pipe, AEM dry flow filter so these are the best ones to have and then the customer had his own little cold air feed near the fog light so we just connected that up with this little piece that we made up just a piece of slash cut stainless steel should do the job it's the customers these are the customers boost pipes because he's grafted in somehow um an Audi S3 core, even though this were a PD 130 and not a 150, he's managed to get that to fit in there with some custom brackets and stuff. It's not the neatest of installs, to be honest, so we've, we're not going to pry our name to that. They do the job, these boost pipes. We've obviously had to modify, there were an extra bend on the top here, and it, it, was, it was a bit messy. Um, one of our, that's what I didn't say when we were doing uh, cool inside, it's got one of our aluminium radiators and a couple of fans on there. The standard fans will do the job. As long as they work, that's the main thing. Um, gearbox, the standard gearbox from the car, but then it's got fourth gear strengthening, the end case strengthening, quaff diff, ARP bolts, upgraded forks, which this one's got the aluminium fork, and I think we've got the steel one on one to two, we'll have to double check again. Um, but then this has got one of the SQS sequentials, which we'll see that when we get inside. Which that's an expensive part that's not necessary, but it feels good when you're driving it. When this came into us, it had an absolutely terrible American nitrous system. The, the only options you had were on or off. And to change the jet size, you have to take it out of the pipe, which is an absolute pain. Um, so... The customer said, what can I do to get more power? So, well, you can get more nitrous in there if you want, but you're obviously going to have to pulse it 
to bring it in nice and smooth because that's where you kill engines. If you just put it on a button where you just get it all, you've got to stage that so you'd end up with four nitrous kits just so you can one, two, three, four and come in nice. Whereas with a with a Wizard and OS control controller and solenoid, we can pulse that 50 times a second. So we can start it at 10% and build it up to 100% within a 500 RPM window, a 1000 RPM window, whatever we want to do. So it should um, should work a lot better. It, I've not used the nitrous on the road, but on the dyno, we can just bring it in so nice and gentle that you're not going to have a big spike of torque on your crank, start bending stuff, snapping stuff, cracking pistons, because that's what these absolutely rubbish American kits, that's what they do. That's what gives nitrous a bad name, to be honest, the American kits. There's more people blowing stuff up with them than enough and sometimes it's used on petrols and the melting stuff it's because it's they're running them lean but on diesel stuff you can't run it lean so what we've what we've done on this in in the ECU you've got three codings we've got a daily sort of fairly small free-ish tune it's still got a little bit 160% injectors can't help it it's got one of our cams by the way as well and you'll know something I forget we um, we've got all three codings, we've made them the same, and then the tweaks that we've made between the codings, we've got a fairly smoke-free daily tune, and that'd be good for track, so you're not gonna be cooking it. For a track car, you can't have it balls out, it's just impossible, unless you're sprinting it. Then we've got, I think that does 320 horsepower or so, we'll put graph up. Then we've got a race tune, which is a diesel-only race tune, that does, 350 odd horsepower and 500 foot pound of torque, whatever it does, it's ridiculous. And then we've got the nitrous tune, which what we do on the nitrous tune, we add more fuel in because when you put the nitrous in, you'll lean it out because you're adding more air with the O in N2O as oxygen. So we're adding extra oxygen in there, extra air. We'd need to then put more fuel in to get it to the same air to fuel ratio as such but it's not very important on diesel like we might be running a 13 AFR on diesel only then you press the nitrous and that might go up to if you didn't add any fuels as such that might go up to a 20 depending on how much nitrous you're running so what we do we might the nitrous tube might it might smoke like crazy when the nitrous are not pressed it might be 11 to 1 which is just ridiculous you won't be able to run that on road that's what some of these crazy foreign cars you see running giving diesels a bad name but then when you press the nitrous you'll you'll bring the air fuel ratio up the smoke will clear up and you'll get more power so there's a certain tipping point where you can add as much fuel as you want in and you'll not make any more power but i don't think we've even found that yet even on the arosa we're still running leaner than we'd want to run on the arosa on the nitrous we want to be at the point where we've got that much in excess of fuel on that that we can run absolutely pouring smoke out on the nitrous and then we'll dial it back until we, we're safe. So engine wise, I think we've pretty much covered. We've got Vibrotechnics engine mount so it checks a little bit. Um, the turbo setup, obviously got one of our tubular manifolds. Can't see any of it, you'd have to dig down there to try and get it and I don't think we can. But this has got the GTD 2872 VR on this one, which is 28, the turbine wheel side, it's a big one. Quite light as well, lighter than the old 25s that we used to run. Flow's pretty good. The 72, the X-Juice on the compressor wheel, which is a fair bit bigger than the 2566 we used to run. The GTD comes from the fact that it's running a 4th gen VNT mechanism and the R, the V is variable vein, the R is ball bearing. So it's ball bearing, a lot bigger. The wheels are, the compressor wheels are a bit heavier, but the turbines are a fair bit lighter than the 25, which were in every wheel anyway. So the, the boost threshold on this is a, about the same, if not a little bit later than a 25, maybe 100 RPM later. So you stamp your foot down at 1500 revs, you're not gonna go anywhere, even with a 2260. It'll pick up, it might surge a little bit if the map is not quite there but it's not going to go anywhere, not of any sort of notice anyway. But at about three grand, 
you've got tons of pull, which people say, oh, well, that's probably having the diesel if it's only room to that, but you've still got it. I can't remember exactly on the figures I'd have to have dyno graphs in front of me. But you've got absolutely tons of torque at three grand, absolute tons. And we're revving it to 56, and you've got full power pretty much all the way to the end, which the, you want to be changing up at probably 54, 55. You don't want to hit the limiter every time. But it does catch you out because it's pulling so nice and clean up to there. You've got a massive power band, tons of usability, and the transient response on these turbos, especially com even compared to a 2260, in my opinion, when you sort of park throttle and you're getting it, it just lights up. And between gears, it just keeps it absolutely spinning. It's, we don't have to do any work on these turbos to keep them spinning between gears. The 25s always give us a bit of trouble. 22s are not too bad, but the 28 just works absolutely perfect. Don't get me wrong, if you're the only person who's going to drive this is your missus going to shops and it's never going to see 5,000 RPM, you're wasting your money printing a 2260 on. But when you want to get on track and absolutely flog it or when you have a quick blast down the bypass, this is the turbo to have on a car like this. It's running a fair amount of boost, I think running 2.8 bar. As people run a lot more on smaller turbos and turbos were different, like a really small turbine and a really big compressor, I'm not a fan of doing that at all. If you monitor everything that you should monitor when you're tuning these EMPs, EGTs, your boosts and uh, AFRs, a lot of those turbos, they might, they might punch the numbers on a dyno, but when you're driving them, they drive like absolute crap. You need a good, even match in between your compressor and your turbine, which we had with the 25, it was fairly, fairly good. You push one too, you push the, you push for too much boost, or too much boost too early, then one we're going to be fighting the other always. But this turbo, nicely matched, works pretty well. Putting a bigger comp wheel in, it's not going to help us. Putting a bigger turbine in, I don't think it'd even fit. But <coughs> it does work pretty well. Because we're running that much boost as well, this has got a six bar map sensor in. We could get away with the four bar, but you're going to be, when you're pressing the nitrous especially, you're going to get very close to what a four bar would be able to read. So if you get a little bit of spike and if your four bar map sensor is reading three bar of boost pressure, obviously take away your one bar atmospheric, if it's reading three bar, it's not going to react any differently than if it's doing four bar of boost. So that's the problem we have in a map sensor when it's so close. And when we see people running three bar map sensor and requesting two bar of boost, we just cry because that's how you blow things up. So, I'm waffling on a little bit and I want to have a good look at rest at car. I'm not even trying to go in there. We'll put a picture up of what we've done with fuel pump. But what we've tried to achieve with the fuel pump, because we've got the external fuel, the external lift pump under there, the sender unit, you could easily just put a tube in there and just have it sucking from underneath, from the bottom of the tank. But that's not going to work. You're still going to have the problem with emptying the ball in there. So we've had to do a little bit of mods. So there'll be a kit release soon for that. This is pretty much nailed now, how we've done it. <coughs> but it's a lot of work, it's not an easy job, it's not going to be cheap because there's a lot of expensive parts just to make it happen. But the way we've done it, it's the right way of doing it. You can definitely do it and cut corners, but you'll probably reap the uh, consequences of doing that. So, in the boot, we've got the nitrous bottle, which this is not his bottle, this is an old one of ours that we need to empty to change the uh, valve to the newer style. They've normally got a nice machined aluminium one. But this we need to uh, empty this and he's got to take his bottle back empty anyway. So, can't get it on ferry apparently. So put the battery in the boot so we've got a bit of room there. This relay is for the bottle eater. So the, sen the pressure sensor which only works when the nitrous is turned on, which this is, is at the front screwed into the nitrous uh, solenoid. Don't have your heater on. Unless you've got that on, are oh, you going to blow this out? And if you blow this out, you're going to start losing nitrous, and you'd always lose more than you want to lose. So, the nitrous installs fairly straightforward. When it goes back to the customer, we're going to flip this round because you want when, when the um, car's accelerating, the liquid nitrous will go to the bottom, and the dip tube will be pointing down there right down at the bottom of the bottle, you want it to be sucking as much of that up. You start putting uh, 
nitrous gas into the engine and it'll just not do the same as liquid. It's got to be liquid because it turns to, evaporates, turns to a gas. So that's the nitrous. Braided line goes all the way to the front. You don't need a braided line. Get away with nylon line, but people like them. Battery in the boot for weight distribution. We've not done that. The customer's done that. I had to put a new battery on there because it was a rubbish old one. Water injection. So we've got, this is a, I think the 3 litre of these tank. So we've got the level sensor that comes up on the dash if that gets low. Pump's there and the nozzle is mounted as high as we can get it. You try, you want to try and get the pump lower than the tank and the nozzle higher than the tank. Which Where this is, it's not going to be. But still, we've put a solenoid on there so that this can't siphon into there. Which These snow performance are probably the best kits if you don't want to run the solenoid. We had so much trouble with all the other kits, it's unbelievable. And we've tried tons of them. We've killed a couple of engines in our cars because of them. Siphoned over night and they fired it up and hydrolock and away you go. And we're like, right, well, that's, uh, that's no good. So, this is in there. The pipe runs all the way to the front. So we'll go and jump inside car. And have a look, there's switches and stuff all over the place in here. I'll just bank seat back a bit so I can see. So we've got the water injection. That's there. It's not on at the minute. We'll put that on when we uh, when we get going. This is the nitrous ball heater. So that's going to be on if the if I put the ignition on. And then this is to turn the nitrous on which the switch needs securing in better. But that's on. So if I take ignition on, can hear that lift pump there. So nitrous control is on. Need some fuel as well. So in there's the water pump controller. You can see when that's going up, when the uh, when the lights start going up, that's when it's getting warmer and colder. You can see that going, and when it starts flashing, that's when it's put your fans on because you're five degrees above your set point. We can set that to whatever we want. We can set it 75 up to 95 degrees, which this will probably set about 80. So we've tried to do as neat in install as possible on this. That's his uh, sequential shifter. Counting up there. Absolute pain when you're in traffic and you coast up to a roundabout or whatever in uh, fourth gear and then you go to set off. Realise you're in wrong gear. So I'll turn nitrous off before I end up setting off and uh, going a bit mad. So uh, we've got the nitrous at the minute. <clears throat> we've got it set up so that the engine RPM goes to the nitrous controller full throttle switch and we put a boost switch in there as well so that it can't activate too early but obviously once that red button's on and that nitrous control is going it once you meet the boost pressure that we set and you go full throttle and the RPM threshold's there which usually you don't want to put it in before 20-25 20 PSI, 20, PSI boost full throttle and probably three grand because you'll just start wheel spinning or boost spiking or doing anything crazy um, it, it goes so <coughs> you don't really need to use nitrous and water methanol together because the nitrous does the cooling but it, it won't hurt to do it but that's not a big deal um, ignore that over there that's the uh, gauge for the fuel pump just uh, verifying that we've, we've done pretty much all the testing now. I just I want to do another run on the road and just make sure it's behaving um, and then just what you can't see probably just out of shot there we've got the Hewitt Industries 50 psi boost gauge which we're not far off maxing out really at times and then the pyrometer EGT gauge what you want to call it the only downside to them they're in uh, Fahrenheit being American but the um, we want to be we don't want to be getting much above 1800 Fahrenheit which is like knocking on a thousand degrees but these PDs they just run up a common rail if it's doing a thousand you'd be melting stuff PDs it's it's definitely too hot but at this level you've got to accept that something's got to give and it's usually uh, coolant temps and uh, exhaust temps but this is flashing away at me telling me we need some coolant in there and we need some fuel but the only reason it's saying about the coolant, when it's cold, the bottle's just a little bit lower than the sensor, but we'll, we're just fine-tuning that just so we keep that off, because when you get up, it expands that much that you start blowing it out of the header tank, and people blame 
blowing cool out of the head of tank on an egg gasket, but they keep filling it, opening it up when it's hot, which you should never do, or under pressure, and it blowing it out everywhere, then topping it right back up, shutting it, going for a drive, it bleeds up, and it's still too high, and then it's just going to keep blowing it out. So what we generally do, just keep topping it up until we just get it where it is. If it blows a tiny little bit out, but then you cool and like it's not flashing when you're done. Absolutely perfect, but it does take a little bit of time to get to that stage. Like on our track cars, you can only just see the coolant in the bottom of the header tank, but when you've done a 45 minute race, it's all the way to the top. So we're probably at the stage on these sort of cars where a bigger header tank positioned in a bit in a different place might help you. Um, so yeah, I think we'll uh, make sure we're not in gear. We'll just see what this starts like. It's not completely flat cold. In the tuning, we extend the glow plug time, which helps with these uh, bigger injectors. But start some sound. Idle's nice. We've lifted the idle up just a little bit, just to give the um, the stiff engine mounts a chance. But it still still rattles a little bit. I'm gonna ignore that coolant light. Single mass flywheel rattle like you'd expect on a uh, on a diesel. But you can't escape that. The common rails are even noisier with a single mass, so I try to avoid um, a single mass on those if possible. And that's what starts killing them silly steel synchros that they put in these gearboxes. Common rail, steel synchro, don't go well together. So, I don't know if there's anything else we needed to talk about too much engine, gearbox, fuel-wise. This car has got um, all the suspension, anti-roll bars, everything, Powerflex bushes, Porsche brakes, everything that we sell. The customer just said, put everything you want on. So that's what we've done. And um, yeah, his bill's fairly big. There'll be loads of people saying that, and why would you spend that money on this car, and why would you spend that? But why does anybody modify any car? It's because you want to. And obviously, there's a satisfying feeling having a diesel that'll still do. Probably, this will probably do 45, 50 to the gallon still. We've had loads of daily drive cars that are really highly strung and they'll still return good economy. And then when you want to punch it, you flick a nitrous switch and you've got 450 horsepower. There's no petrol car that's got that. Obviously, you'd have to settle for an old rusty borer that rattles and checks and bangs, but each to their own and uh, we're just here, while other customers want it, we'll do it. As soon as the customer requirement's not there anymore, then we might have to do things a bit differently, but we're happy doing this for people, if they're happy, if they're happy for it, and that's what we like to do. Cost, something's only expensive if it's not good value for money. And <clears throat> if you took a, a Golf TFSI to a company, whoever it could be, and they did what we've done to this, we're 100% certain it'd be more expensive than what we've charged to do this. It's obviously, to get 450 horsepower, maybe it's not more expensive, but to do the actual amount of work, to get the engine where it is, and to do what we've done to it, it definitely would be more expensive. So, we'll let this get up to temp. We'll get some cameras thrown in it. Sunny again, even though it was raining slash snowing. 10 minutes ago and um, we'll go for a little run in it and just see what it does we've got a we've got a trip planned to brunters in the next couple of weeks we're going to take all the cars there this should still be here by then and we'll probably take that as well so we'll get a nice acceleration video everybody always asks us for the uh, 100 to 200 figures that seems to be a good benchmark against some very fast cars um, so we'll try and get we'll try and get that in as well. Um, but I'll just go for a little run and just talk about how this is to to live with. Basically, it's uh, it's pretty good. Um, any questions anybody's got, put them in the comment section. On this video, I'm sure there's going to be absolutely tons of people asking loads and loads of questions. So we might reply to everyone briefly in the comments, but we will probably use the comment section as a follow-up video, maybe. And we'll um, we'll try and we'll try and answer all those questions in another video, 
maybe with some demonstrations. And what we've done here as well, we've started out in the sort of wild daily PD engine part, which we're going to do some blogs about PD tuning. We've started out with a sort of wildest iteration of that, but we will try and get, um, we'll try and work our way down to the sort of more standard stuff and common problems that you get with him just when, when you want to do a standard remap and stuff like that. But we've been doing these that long now, we didn't think the sort of, the demand for these were going to still be there, but whenever we do anything to do with a PD, especially these older stuff, we just get tons of interest, so it's still, it's still not, a, uh, we're not flogging a dead horse yet, so any questions you've got, bang them in the comment section, share it about, subscribe if you can, we'll try and do as much stuff as we can, and any suggestions on what you want us to do, put them in there, and we'll do as best to do some videos. Once we've got this uh, A5 project working absolutely perfect and we, we've done what we need to do, we, we're going to do tons more videos because that's taking up a lot of our time at the minute, video wise. So we'll go for a run and see how we get on. So we're out in the border. So it needs some fuel in it, so I might as well go get some. Uh, might as well get some and go for a run. Little drive while we're there. That's it. Sit back a little bit. It drives. Really nice. Exactly as I'd expect. So, uh, really nice when you're setting off. Pouring out loads of smoke. Just nothing not to like, really. It's not far up temperature coolant wise. 79 according to my bag comp. So, it's nearly where it needs to be. So, we'll uh, see how we get on. But Oil always takes a lot longer than coolant to get warm, especially when you've got oil coolers on. That's always worth bearing in mind. A lot of people uh, think, oh, your coolant reads 90 on gauge, let's, let's go for it. It's reading 99, it's only 79, so it's, uh, it's always worth keeping an eye on you oil temps as well. This car's not going to gauge because it's only a, a road car so it's not a big deal. It's fairly busy so we're only going to get a, a little squeeze out of thought if we get any any I put water injection on. See how we go but it's uh, Drives absolutely fine. Tipping 20 psi there, just from that little tiny little squeeze. So very responsive turbo. You literally don't need any more in the bottom end. Like 10 psi just cruising along. No missing. Nothing like. 35 mile an hour. No problem at all. So we're doing 5 psi at cruise now. Touch throttle 10. Touch a bit harder 15. It's a super responsive turbo. I'm at two and a half gram. I'll just punch it. See what happens. I think the smoke miss is kicking out full throttle. It's just more than I'd want on the road, but this is on the this is on the race tune as such, which is a no nitrous sort of as balls out as you'd want to run on your daily driver car. So it's uh, a bit too smoky. 
thought of it, we'll, uh, we'll swap to nitrous coding. We'll try and uh, try and do a visual representation of what nitrous does on a road car. It's, it's quite funny. Change that little number there. So it's actually the, the nitrous tune on this car is the four wheel drive coding. So that's why these ECUs have all these different code blocks in. First ignition off, ignition on. Tell me I need some fuel still. We've got some of nitrous tube now. I'm just going to do a little log. The coolant temp's still only at 80 even after that squeeze. They're all good. So the nitrous heater's on. The nitrous control is on. So in theory now, we can have a nitrous. So we'll try and get it in gear pull first and we'll uh, it's probably just going to wheel spin even in third gear this will still wheel spin when nitrous comes in I'm sure so we'll have to uh, be holding on pretty tight we'll uh, see how it goes start it like 30 mile an hour. Let's see what happens. Off they go. So what happened there what? Wheel spun that bad that when it were cutting fuel we're getting a bit now popping a bang from nitrous so we should be all right when we're wheel spinning for nitrous to be going in but not when uh, not when your traction control is cutting your fuel because what you get then you just get a, a lean spot and uh, it goes that lean that the engine is pretty much cutting out and then you end up with fuel coming out of your exhaust that's not burned properly and all that sort of stuff Right then, so it, out on road, let it have some nitrous. I didn't turn traction control off on the first run, mistakenly, and it just absolutely lit front wheels up, spluttering and banging and popping. Dan's always trying to get in on videos. Um, it absolutely flies, ridiculous how fast it is. Definitely too much for a daily driver, but this is what he wants, so it's what he gets. On the daily tune, Smoke's not unbearable, but it's doing a real 316, I think it is. Real 316 horsepower, so it's there's loads of figures floating around the internet. People have got 350, I've got this, I've got that. We never see it. We get them cars that come here and the Primont Dyno, and the face drops when it does 100 horsepower less on our Dyno than it has somewhere else. So I know driving this that it's fast. So we need to. Uh, tie up a few loose ends we'll try and see what performance figures we've got out in it but we've uh, when we go to Bruntingthorpe but we uh, we're probably not going to launch this it's uh, don't want to break anything let customer do that but it's uh, yeah it should be should be a good car it's going to upset a few people wolf in sheep's clothing and uh, We'll do a bit of driving and see if we can get some economy figures from it, but we'll probably leave that to the customer to uh, have it for a few weeks and uh, get back to us. Yeah, it's a really nice car. I prefer the, if you're going to go for something this crazy, have it on the track rather than uh, driving like an idiot on the road, but each to their own. Not everybody can afford to go on track days because they, they can get expensive, especially when the bug bites and you start doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Danny will know when he eventually gets a fast track car rather than all rubbish he keeps buying. But it's uh, 
yeah we'll get all this finished up and get it back to the customer hopefully he's happy thank you make sure you subscribe spec list below all the parts fitted to this car are listed on our website pretty much so just rather than asking what was he got what this have a look at the spec list that it takes you to everyone on there that's read the link click on there have a look see what you get you can see it's got a lot of work tons of it i can't even remember how much labor we've had on it but it's a lot it's going to be in hundreds of hours by the time we've finished it yeah thank you very much